Wampanoag means Eastern people, or people of the dawn, or people of the first light. The Wampanoag use dugout canoes by hollowing out huge trees. They use these boats, called machoons, for transportation and ocean fishing trips. The traditional Wampanoag houses are dome-shaped and covered with bark or cattail reeds. Hubbub was an ancient tribal game that's still played today. Have you ever heard of wampum? Well, Wampanoag artists were really especially famous for crafting wampum out of white and purple shell beads. Wampum beads were traded as a kind of currency, but they were more culturally important as an art material. We are happy to take you on the second part of our journey to the home site of the Wampanoag people. Located on the banks of the Eel River at Plymouth Plantation, the Wampanoag home site is a recreation of a 17th century coastal home for the Wampanoag. This Wampanoag home site would be occupied during the warmer times of the year, when the Wampanoag would plant their crops and hunt and fish. And in the cold months, they would return inland to their winter village. Let's begin our tour. Welcome back to the Wampanoag home site. Behind me here is a Wee-Tu. This is a winter style home for the Wampanoag people. Come on inside and let's learn a little more about it. Oh, welcome back. I'm Brian. This is my counterpart, Alicia. We're here to talk to you about the Wampanoag culture and their home. This home here is called a Nushwitu, made with very thick, durable bark. It's very strong, and the frame is also made with cedar poles, tied here with cedar bark. It's used to support the entire bark outside the frame. It's also used to support these mats, which are made of bulrush, to keep your warm, insulated, your house very warm and insulated. And these beds are also used to keep you very warm and comfortable too. This hide here is a black bear, very long fur, very thick and very warm. And this would be traditionally your bed if you were in a Wampanoag home back then. You'd even see rugs along the floor here to keep you nice and comfortable. This house here would probably hold about maybe eight to 10 people, depending what the ratio of kids are, um, in probably just the winter time. Over here, we have my friend here, Alicia, making uh, a doll for one of the children we have here. So this doll here would be something that the girls would make. A lot of the toys that kids played with taught them things they needed to know when they were older. Girls would be responsible for accessorizing the dolls. This would teach them how to make clothing, similar to what I'm wearing. So you can see right now that I have a dress made out of deer hide, as does the doll. We both have woven belts. So young girls would learn how to make this when they're very young. We also have a toy machine or a toy boat that kids would play with. Boys would be the ones to learn how to make these boats and we'll learn later how to make an actual machine. For us here you might be wondering why we dress a little bit differently. This hair piece that I have on my head, most of the men would wear one like this. It's made from long porcupine hair. Very stiff hair, not as hard as the quills, but stiff enough that it stands nice and straight. And the bright reds you see here are actually dyed deer hair. This will be worn by some of the men for special occasions, which is when you come to visit. Also, the tattooing on my face and on my body was very traditional, both by the men and women for the Wampanoags. Many Native people in the Northeast tattooed their entire body for uh, spiritual protection, clan identification, also sometimes just for decorations and patterns. You look around, most of our family would store foods in these bags and baskets, like the one here Alicia made. This one here is made out of bulrush. Labor between men and women was divided um, in life-giving and life-taking ways. Women would be the ones who would work with the bulrush, making the mats for the homes, as Brian mentioned, any bags that would be used for storage, and the clothing and cooking would be done by women as well. So this bag is made out of bulrush. It's a hollow aquatic reed that would be used for storage. A bag like this one here would be made from plant fibers. Milkweed, dogbane, and false nettle would be plants that are dried out in the fall. The outer bark is broken off and rolled on the knee. That bark will twist together and create a cord that can be dyed with other natural plant fibers and then woven into a bag. Like Alicia said, the duties sometimes were for women as life givers and the men as life takers. We would do the hunting and the fishing 
And that would be where a lot of our food would be coming from, from fishing, about 20% of it. We also grew an awful lot in our garden of corn, beans, squash, sunflowers, uh, wild onion, garlic. Uh, about 60% of that was out of the garden, and another 20% from hunting, like large deer and moose and raccoon and rabbit. And those are some of the furs you'll see around here today. For the Wampanoags, we've been here for about 11,600 years, and it's a very comfortable lifestyle. We were pretty good at it by the time the Pilgrim showed. And that's why we taught them how to plant and how to hunt and how to fish, because we knew how to do that stuff quite well. And if we were lucky enough as men to trap some animals, we'd sometimes make little cloaks like this one here, which is made out of fox. That one there is Alicia's, and she'll show you how it's put together. You would normally want to wear the fur on the inside. That way it'll keep you a lot warmer. So you wear it right around your shoulders like a cape. If it's raining though, it would be really common to see people wearing the fur on the outside. That way the rain will slide right off the fur and you still stay nice and dry. So hopefully you'll start to see in this home site that you'll see that there's different duties and responsibilities, but the Wampanoag people live quite comfortably and they've been here for thousands of years. They, they traded with each other, had ceremonies with each other, sung and danced with each other. And over here you're going to see our garden where we grew the crops, but you'll also see where we're going to be doing our fishing, building a machoon or a dugout canoe like Alicia showed you here, uh, also showing our fishing nets and spears and harpoons. What we learned. The Wampanoag survived by fishing, planting, harvesting, and hunting. Wampanoag men were responsible for hunting and fishing. The women took care of the gardening and the gathering of wild fruits, nuts, berries, and shellfish. Children did not have many chores or responsibilities. They helped in the garden and kept the birds and the animals away from the crops. Children had toys that would help them to learn. Dolls for the girls and boats for the boys. Woven bags and baskets were hung on the walls and used for storage. Join us in the gardens of the Wampanoag home site where we will see how the Wampanoag planted and grew the vegetables that sustained them throughout the year. You're gonna see some very interesting gardening techniques in this garden. Hi, I'm just doing some work in the garden right now. In a typical Wampanoag village, you would find the women who are doing the gardening, and in here we would be growing corn, beans, squash, pumpkins, and watermelon. You would also find sunflowers growing in the garden, and on the outer edges of a village, you might find different herbs that would be used for cooking, like wild onions, wild garlic, or dogbane, which would be used to make fibers for bags. The way the garden is planted, you would dig a hole, and put three herring into each hole. Build a mound up over top and then plant the corn first. You would do this after the fish is decomposed about three weeks later. Once the corn is planted, you wait until it's about knee high. Then the beans and the squash will be planted. The beans will grow up the corn stalk. The squash leaves will provide shade for the beans to grow. They will also collect the morning dew and then slowly release it back into the mound, keeping the seeds moisturized. These three plants work together symbiotically to actually produce more food than if you were planting them in rows like we do today. Behind me here is a corn watch tower. This is where children would play. And they would also bring small pebbles up there with them. They'd be the ones to keep the birds and animals out of the garden. What we learned. Women and children worked in the gardens. Wampanoag gardens included sunflowers, squash, pumpkins, corn, watermelon, wild onions, and herbs. The Wampanoag would build a small mound and place three small fish in that mound. When the fish decomposed, they would plant the corn in the mound. The fish served as a sort of fertilizer for the corn. Children climbed the corn watchtower and would scare off the birds and animals with little pebbles. Are you starting to get a little bit hungry? Let's head over to that cooking area where something smells really good on the open fire. We'll learn about how the Wampanoag cooked their meals and what they ate at different times of the year. Hi, I'm here in a Wampanoag cooking area. Since Wampanoag people would have had villages anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand families, you would find just as many fireplaces all around for people to cook on. 
Today we're making quail. It's roasting, it's seasoned with wild onions and wild garlic. And all of the food would have been seasonal. So quail would definitely be something you would find in the early fall. Spring, summer, and early fall, you would also have a lot of corn, beans, squash, uh, still some fish, and you're starting to move into smaller game. In the winter time, the majority of your diet is going to come from red meat. So a lot of large game, deer, bear, elk, and moose would be very common. That kind of red meat will actually insulate your body and keep you warmer, whereas the lighter food in the summer will keep your body cooler and acclimate you to the weather. In the clay pot here, we're making a cranberry tea. And clay pots would have been a traditional cooking vessel. By the way it's fired, the women will coil the clay after there's been sand and crushed shell mixed into it, and they'll fire it using a pit. You dig the pit, put the clay in there, and then build a brush fire up and around it. Then you can use it for cooking. You would rest it on three large rocks and put hot coals underneath rather than putting the clay pot right into the fire. There were no set meal times. Wampanoag people would eat as they got hungry, so there would always be something cooking. What we learned. Wampanoag ate lighter foods in the warmer months. Small game, fish, vegetables, fruits, squash, cranberries, and walnuts. They believed it kept them cooler. In the winter, they ate heavier meats deer, moose, red meat. They believed it was the red meat that would help to keep them warm during the winter months. They made clay pots and cooked over an open fire. And there were no set meal times. The Wampanoag ate whenever they were hungry. We are coming up to the banks of the Eel River, where we're going to meet James, a member of the Aquina Wampanoag. The ancestors of the Wampanoag people have lived for at least 10,000 years at Aquina and throughout the island of Martha's Vineyard. They were fishermen and farmers. Let's go meet James. Hello, my name is James and I'm part of the Aquina Wampanoag tribe from Aquina over on Martha's Vineyard. Right now we're actually working on a traditional vessel which we would call a machoon. And when you would make a boat, you'd have a fire in here, traditionally, that'd be spread the entire length of the log, burning 24 hours a day. The burning in the vessel not only hollows it out, but as well hardens the wood, smoothens it, but as well as it waterproofs it. Because this, seeing as though it being a very a green tree, has lots of sap in it. So all that burning in the vessel is taking that sap and pushing it right to the outside edges in the wood. So that's what seals the boat up and waterproofs the vessel. This particular type of wood that we're working with is actually white pine. In the time period, pine was used just because it actually has lots of sap in it. But not only that, it actually grows right in sandy soil, so something right next to the water. But besides pine, the harder woods were preferred, such as chestnut, even elm. And those woods were, back in the time period, about 8 feet in diameter. So you could imagine how wide these boats would have been, but as well as that, on average, vessel would have been about 60 feet long that would have held two rows of 20 men so 40 men per boat and in the time period these vessels would have been used for fishing traveling transportation going back and forth from here from to Plymouth from the Cape to the islands daily so traditionally we'd actually make these boats in the springtime when all the sap is in the wood and in order to actually fall the tree we would burn it down we would take wet clay and pack it up around the tree about five feet high and pack it pretty thick and burn it from the base and scrape the tree and round it off until the tree fell over. And that is actually how you would shape one end of the tree. Then you'd burn it to length the same way you'd fall it. Burn it, scrape it, and round the other end off. So both ends were completely finished before you even started burning inside the boat. Then you would start a fire the full length of the log and burn it down till you get to the thickest part of the tree. And once you get to the thickest part of the tree, you keep the hot coal centered, and as it burns down into it, it will burn out. So we use water to control it, but as well is that we take wet clay and even wet mud and pack it along the edges where you don't want it to burn. But also, you kind of have to eye the sides. We actually would feel the edges, and as it burns, feel on the bottom of the boat. Because along the bottom, if you can feel heat, that's an estimate of anywhere from four to six inches of wood that you want to leave. 
so it acts like a natural balance or even a keel. What we've learned. Machoons are dugout canoes made from large straight trees, usually white pine or chestnut. The tree was brought down by burning it around the base until it fell. The Wampanoag would remove the bark and branches. Then they would burn and scrape the inside of the log. A large machoon could carry as many as 20 to 40 men. The Wampanoag used the machoons for transportation and for fishing. We hope that you've enjoyed your visit here at Plymouth Plantation with us learning about the Wampanoag people. We also hope that you'll continue to learn about Native American people and the role that they've played and continue to play in the development of this country. And we hope you tune back in next week on November 16th to view a rebroadcast of last year's Thanksgiving virtual field trip to Plymouth Plantation. And teachers and students, be sure to check out the great resources on scholastic.com and plymouth.org all about the first Thanksgiving.